Hi everyone, welcome back to another video of Mike's Geek Corner with your host, Mike Quevedo. This time I'm going to talk of Zack Snyder DC film work, all the way from 2009's Watchmen to his four-hour director's cut of Justice League, which premiered on Thursday 18th of March on HBO Max. Be warned, this video contains spoilers. I'm going to talk about what it is that I appreciate about Snyder's work in the DC movies, and then I'm going to cite some examples of other past films that subsequently attained more appreciation after not receiving positive reception at the box office and or with critics when they were first released in theaters to reflect how it is possible that the DC Snyderverse might follow likewise. Actually, I think it might have already begun to some extent, as his Justice League has been received quite well with fans and critics, and I've been noticing Man of Steel and Batman v Superman have been getting some reappraisal. So I'm a fan of Zack Snyder's DC movie work. I love Watchmen, Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, particularly the Ultimate Edition, and now I'm totally adding his, not just Whedon's, Justice League to the list. A lot of my favorite movie directors are those that have a very uncompromising vision of their films. Sergio Leone, Stanley Kubrick, John Borman, Ridley Scott, Terry Gilliam, John Carpenter, Paul Verhoeven, Sam Raimi, David Lynch, and George Miller. In his films, Zack Snyder has the type of qualities most of these listed filmmakers had their work stamped with. Watchmen was a film that had been 20 years or so in the making. The aforementioned Terry Gilliam, Darren Aronofsky, and Born Supremacy director Paul Greengrass had all attempted at developing the iconic graphic novel into celluloid with ultimately no green light given. Finally, after successfully adapting Frank Miller's graphic novel 300 into a box office bonanza in 2007 with a unique visual flair of heightened realism, which he would incorporate to later comic projects, Zack Snyder was given directorial reign on the anticipated Alan Moore Dave Gibbons adaptation, which satirizes the superhero genre within an alternate history where in 1985 the U.S. is heading towards World War III with the Soviet Union, while also the mysterious murder of a governmentized superhero makes a group of superheroes come out of retirement. I think with this project was always going to be an impossible task to please everyone. It's just a very complicated piece of literature and sequential art with a great amount of exposition. Still, working from a script by X-Men and X-2's David Hayter and Alex C, as well as using the graphic novel's images as models for the storyboards and using both the green screens and real sets, Snyder delivered in his cut a not perfect, but nonetheless a very watchable three-hour film that not only honored the source material, but also captured the type of crafty generosity of a thinking man's film. It's a superhero film that can appeal to fans of 2001 and Space Odyssey's theme of existentialism, it has the neo-noir style, sense of paranoia, and sense of a decaying and morally bankrupt urban environment of Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. It has the foreboding presence of nuclear warfare of the day the earth stood still. It has the German expressionism of Fritz Lang's Metropolis. It has the cynical dark humor and ultra-violence of Robocop. It displays a kind of otherworldly imagery John Borman established in Excalibur. It has a type of ambiguity found in Blade Runner. This is the adaptation of Watchmen that Zack Snyder delivered one that over time has gained more appreciation. Four years later, after attempts by Kick-Ass creator Mark Millar, Stardust director Matthew Bond, and Mick G to develop a new film for a Superman reboot did not take off, Zack Snyder was hired in 2010 to direct Man of Steel, which was written by Dark Knight trilogy writer David S. Goyer and produced by its director Christopher Nolan. Just like Nolan had done previously on Batman Begins, Snyder gave us a non-linear beginning in his Man of Steel movie. Another clear influence is John Byrne's Man of Steel comic miniseries from 1986, which had a Krypton being a planet with an ethicon and emotionless society, with jor and Lara being the progressive citizens. Man of Steel also reflects John Byrne's 1988 Supergirl Sarah storyline, where Superman executes Sod and his three relentless Kryptonian cohorts. Snyder also seems to embrace the sci-fi sentimentality that had inspired Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster to create Superman back in the late 30s, such as the John Carter books by Edgar Rice Burroughs, as well as a Flash Gordon comic strip by Alex Raymond, as the movie starts in the planet Krypton in a very swashbuckling type action sequence that is taking to those in the Star Wars installments. More shoutouts to the past are echoed in Henry Cavill's suit, which feels like an updated version of the suit from the 1940s Superman Max Fleischer cartoons. He also lays out this modernized version of Superman with a proper measure of classic traits of being an outsider and raising good old American values, but also brings a grounded layer that makes our hero more relatable as he shows uncertainty in his powers and his place in this world. His transformation into the noble hero we know is a work in progress as Zack Snyder instills Joseph Campbell's template of a hero's journey onto Clark Kent, making him a modern-day Perseus or Hercules. All film is subjective. If you didn't like Man of Steel, that's cool. I will just say that if you're someone who liked Tim Burton's Batman films in spite of the strong liberties he took with the source material, 
I would imagine Snyder's take on Superman would be a lot easier to digest. Three years later, undoubtedly our reaction to the MCU's continuously expanding shared universe, we get Snyder's follow-up to Man of Steel in Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. Speaking particularly of the Ultimate Edition, Zack Snyder, working from a script from David S. Goyer and Argo's scribe Chris Terrio, delivers a very layered epic inspired by the Dark Knight Returns and Death of Superman comics. The film evokes a sense of being Snyder's spiritual follow-up to Watchmen. Just as Rorschach in Watchmen has a paranoid perception regarding the comedian's murder, so does Batman in BBS in regards to Superman's power after witnessing the destructive aftermath from the latter's fight with Sod in Metropolis. Superman is seen very much in the same controversial manner as Dr. Manhattan in Watchmen for his seemingly unlimited power. And just like Ozymandias in Watchmen was the architect of a chain reaction of events that led to Rorschach's imprisonment and Dr. Manhattan's exile from Earth, Lex Luthor is a mastermind behind a scheme to have the Dark Knight and the Man of Steel collide. There's also the unmistakable presence of the influence on John Borman's Excalibur in the picture. The scene in Excalibur where King Arthur, after feeling ashamed for abusing the power of the Sword of Excalibur to satisfy his rage to defeat the formidable knight Lancelot, recognizes his mistake and Lancelot becomes his knight and friend, is mirrored in the confrontation between the two titular heroes in Snyder's film. As Batman is about to strike Superman with a kryptonite spear, he is talking to Reason, and after feeling how misguided he'd been, they both become allies. Also, just as Mordred is an evil offspring of the evil sorcerer Morgana, so is Doomsday the destructive result of the DNA of the twisted Luthor and the relentless Sod. The look of the two titular heroes, as well as Wonder Woman's, are gloriously and uncompromisingly faithful to their comic counterparts. Ever present are Snyder's slush visuals, and to me in particular in BBS is a dream sequence we see Batman in a post-apocalyptic future as the leader of a resistance where a tyrannical Superman rules with an iron fist and with the help of parademons. The way this sequence is set up makes me think of the craftsmanship of Stanley Kubrick in 2001 Space Odyssey, George Miller in Mac Max Fury Road, James Cameron in the first two Terminator films, Terry Gilliam in Brazil and Twelve Monkeys, Franklin J. Schaffner in Planet of the Apes, Ridley Scott in Blade Runner, and again, John Borman in Excalibur. And now, after four years since Joss Whedon's tampering of Zack Snyder's vision for Justice League hit theaters, finally we have the Snyderverse in its completed glory. As Snyder's four-hour Justice League's arrival on HBO Max has shown once again the crafty visionary that he is. The amount of difference between the director's cut of Daredevil and the theatrical version is one that roughly reaches the level of difference between Snyder's version of Justice League and Whedon's cut. The premise is essentially the same, which has parallels to 1987's Legends comic miniseries and Brave and the Bold number 28, but it's got much more heart and meat. It's all Snyder's uncompromised vision. There's more insight into Darkseid, who looks terrific in the film. For Steppenwolf, here they went with Snyder's original look from Batman v Superman as opposed to Whedon's redesign, and he is an impressive imposing figure, and here he's established as a secondary villain with a more clear motive. Darkseid's master torturer, the Sod, also makes his appearance in the film. A bit of liberty was taken with the look of both Steppenwolf and the Sod, but much like the Penguin and Batman Returns, their design is an effective one for the style that Snyder establishes in this universe. Much more depthful insight is given to Cyborg and Barry Allen. Cyborg is given a more fleshed out backstory as far as his relationship with his father, and more details from back in his football days. He is very much a focal character in the film. We are also introduced in this version to Iris West, who is to become Barry Allen's love interest down the road. Her introduction is a scene that might have been a bit too long, and maybe could have done without, but it's no big detraction. Scenes in Atlantis are given more exposure and depth, as we see more of Mira along with Bulko in scenes with Arthur Curry. There's also more scenes with Bruce and Alfred, which is greatly appreciated. Diana gets extended screen time at the Temple of Crete, where she learns from the parietal drawings that Darkseid and Steppenwolf plan to merge the mother boxes and terraform Earth into another apocalypse, plus a little extra at a heartful moment after she rescues the children at the museum. Some of the slow motion tends to get overuse at times, and some of the soundtrack choices are a little iffy to me, but they are minor complaints. Superman gets lesser time in this version, but he's used much more effectively. I appreciated him wearing the black costume just like he did in the comics when he returned from the dead, but I wish he'd returned to the traditional one in the epilogue. Batman displays much more initiative as far as uniting the league here than in Whedon's version. Martian Manhunter's appearance in the film is a very fanboy enjoyment. Even if you do have to wonder why he never showed up to help in Man of Steel, BBS, and here in Justice League. Luther's escape from Arkham gives some shields, and his scene with Deathstroke here is even more fruitful. Last but not least, the interaction between Batman and Joker in the post-apocalyptic dream sequence is astounding. It makes me want a Batflick movie now even more. Zack Snyder's Justice League, 
unlike Whedon's studio compromise, which made it look like an Avengers wannabe, is its own unique creature. It is evident that Snyder feels secure in his vision. He does not need to take anything from Marvel. What he's done is Justice League feels like a moving Jack Kirby sequential art that is painted with the oils of Frank Rosetta. I appreciate how it respects the fans of the source material and the general audiences of all ages by treating the material with the same dedication Peter Jackson did with Lord of the Rings, Walter Mersch with Return to Oz, Andy Serkis with Mowgli, and Tim Burton with his two Batman films. I feel Zack Snyder accomplished this with Justice League and his previous three DC projects. As T.S. Eliot said, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go, end quote. That's how I view the DC Snyderverse. The Marvel films, which I love, are done in such a way that kind of makes them relatively safe because they want their films to be as neatly accessible and non-alienated to as many demographics as possible, from the comic fans to the little ones to the adults and to the foreign market, and understandably so, as these are multi-million dollar investments. And because of this risk factor, I for one admire when someone like Zack Snyder decides to add variety and or push the envelope on a project of this size. This type of boldness tends to seem thankless at first, but here are some examples of past films that went against certain trends and eventually achieved lasting appreciation. When Return to Us came out in 1985, it was criticized for being too dark and not a musical like the 1939 classic Wizard of Oz. Now it's a praise favorite that is true to the L. Frank Baum books. The 1980 Flash Gordon film didn't click with a lot of audiences here in the States when it first came out, as people didn't connect with its tone and visual style until much later on. It offered a different take than what Star Wars or Donner Superman were doing, which was the look of a cartoon come to life. The 1979 Dracula with Frank Langella and Laurence Olivier, directed by John Batham, wasn't appreciated at first by fans of the previous iterations, as it took a different road as far as some chronological order, and Langella not displaying fangs or blood on his face, and portraying the title role a bit more as a sympathetic tragic figure who found Wolf's howling not sweet music, but sad. Years later, it's rediscovered as a gem in the cinematic annals of Dracula. Relatively more recent cult favorites such as Speed Racer and Punisher Warzone were also heavily panned upon their release in theaters in 2008 and flopped. Both films basically went a different direction than what the two superhero box office juggernauts of that year, Iron Man and the Dark Knight, had established with their more grounded aesthetic, whereas the former two were hyper-stylized renditions that have obtained more appreciation over the years. Speed Racer has proven to have been ahead of its time, as recent manga anime live action films like Detective Pikachu and Alita Battle Angel seem to have embraced a type of idiosyncratic style that the Wachowski brothers had adapted years earlier. And Punisher Warzone's graphic over the top violence, which followed the tone of the Punisher Max series by Garth Ennis, is one that would resurface years later in movies like Deadpool and John Wick, along with the use of the neon lighting in the latter one. Doctor Strange director Scott Derrickson has been one of the film's loudest supporters. So whether or not Zack Snyder will continue to be involved in more endeavors in the DCEU, he has unquestionably put together films that showcase his imaginative and bold craftsmanship and undeterred vision for a genre and characters that benefit immensely from it in the world of celluloid and possibly will establish a model for future filmmakers down the road. If you haven't seen Zack Snyder's Justice League on HBO Max, you should. It's quite an experience. And if you're someone who didn't care much for Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Watchmen, someday give him another shot. You may just get another perspective. I know I did on films I didn't care for much initially, like Dark City and the original Tron. And so that's it for this appreciation piece. Hope you enjoyed it. If so, give it a like. Make sure you subscribe. Feel free to leave your comments below. And I'll be seeing you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.